He served three Holy Roman Emperors, beating Italians at their own game, working himself to the pinnacle of Western art and music, and he wrote the book on counterpoint while suffering from a debilitating chronic illness, only to be summarily forgotten, save for his book, which is still in print, albeit not in the original Latin. I'm the Classical Nerd, and today we're talking about Johann Josef Fuchs. Please don't mispronounce his name. Fuchs was born in 1660 in the southeast of Austria. Like many figures of this time period, it is almost impossible to say anything substantive about Fuchs's young life. We do know that he didn't come from an exceptionally rich background, but his father, Andreas, was involved in the church in St. Marian, which was likely Johann Josef's first exposure to music. Much later in life, Fuchs would write about how, at a young age, he experienced a strange urge towards music and a desire to learn as much as he possibly could about the subject. Fuchs started attending Graz University in 1680, only to leave two months before he was supposed to graduate, and instead he went to a Jesuit university in Ingolstadt, where he there studied law and music. And it's sort of a mysterious disappearance until you realize that he couldn't study law in Graz. He could study in Ingolstadt, which is why he left. From 1685 until 1688, he was the organist at a church in Ingolstadt, but from 1689 until 1696, when he got married, we don't actually know where he was or what he was doing. So let's zoom out and let's talk about the musical culture in Austria at the end of the 17th century. In that time, professional music making was relegated to the church or the courts. And Fuchs was an internationally savvy composer. It, despite being Austrian, he was able to write fluently in the Italian style. This is sort of strange to our ears now, because a lot of fans of Baroque music will just listen to it and they think, well, this is the Baroque style. If you're a little bit more fluent in that era, you might be able to pick out some stylistic differences. This is especially true with Baroque opera. Italian opera has its own set style and you know, sort of the way it works is a little bit different from others. But even then, there are so many more similarities between music of different nationalities of that era that it's sometimes surprising to people to hear that there were such vast discrepancies to the point that non-Italian courts and churches wanted to get Italian composers and musicians. To the point that if you didn't know the Italian style, sometimes you faked it by changing your name to something Italian or by somehow Italianizing your name to get you better job prospects. So Fuchs, as someone who knew the Italian style, well, this has led a lot of scholars to believe that at some point in this mysterious spooky zone that we don't know anything about his life, he went to Italy to study. Perhaps he went to Rome, or maybe he could have just spent some time locally. There were a lot of Italian expatriates in Vienna. The Viennese upper crust all spoke Italian because they loved Italian music so much. Um, and it makes sense that he could have, theoretically, learned the Italian style from these Italian expatriates. What backs this up even more was actually his marriage. He got married in June 1696 to Clara Juliana Schnitzenbaum. That's just one of the greatest names in all of music history. Like, Fuchs is a funny enough name, but oh my goodness, if I were him, I would have changed my name to hers. Schnitzenbaum is so great. Anyway, not to get too off track, but she was well connected to the court. And there's no way that they would have been able to be in contact if Fuchs wasn't already associated with the court and was working as a court composer, even if he wasn't working as a court composer officially. There's no way they would have known each other otherwise. Also, at this point, he had written a mass that was played for the then Holy Roman Emperor, Leopold I, and this mass was dedicated to Leopold after Leopold had already heard it. Leopold made Fuchs a court composer officially in 1698, though Fuchs himself was a little bit squirrely on when he actually did start his employment in the Viennese court. He even gave the date as far back as 1693. Now, the idea of a freelancer really didn't exist back then. It wasn't until Mozart tried to do it and worked himself to death, and then Beethoven succeeded at doing that, that we start getting sort of the idea of a composer who's not affiliated with the church or the court as the primary source of their income. But in today's language, we might 
call Fuchs a bit of a freelancer because he clearly did work for the court before he was officially hired, but he was officially hired in 1698. Importantly, Fuchs was a court composer. He was not the court composer because there was a ton of music to write and there was no copy and paste function. There's a probably apocryphal story about how Leopold tricked the Italians already in his employ by claiming that Fuchs was an Italian composer, not disclosing his name, but just saying uh, to the current Italian court composers, hey, let's listen to this mass by this great Italian composer. And all the Italians went, it's great. And then Leopold was like, psych, he's Austrian. You see the reason I doubt that this story actually happened? It is funny though. Over the next 13 years, in addition to his employment with various churches in Vienna, Fuchs worked his way up to become the music director of the imperial court the Hofkapellmeister. This was a special distinction for Fuchs and really anybody who got this role because Vienna's place as a cultural and thus musical capital meant that anybody who was the top dog at the imperial court also held the single most prestigious role in the entirety of Western music at the time. His law background was especially helpful with dealing with the court musicians who nearly totaled 150 and whose personal interests needed to be negotiated. The coronation of Charles VI was an especially grandiose event, and Fuchs wrote an opera, Costanza e Fortezza, kinda sorta for the event. It didn't say that it was, but, you know, it basically was. There was a specially designed open-air theater in Prague that was built especially for this occasion, and Fuchs was too sick to attend. He had chronic gout, but the incoming emperor wanted him there anyway, so even though he wasn't actually there conducting the premiere, he was still there. And the, how he got there is just, just insane, because instead of taking a carriage, which would have been really bad for his gout, the incoming emperor sent four men to carry him in one of these things. They carried him like 200 miles, like he was the freaking Ark of the Covenant. I don't think that Fuchs has ever made somebody's face melt off, but I wouldn't necessarily put it past him. Fuchs did seem to know the acoustics of the environment for which he was writing this piece, and the flutist and composer Johann Joachim Kvantz, who performed in the premiere, noted that Fuchs's music wasn't theatrical, and said that Fuchs's gallant style of writing for the voice worked. As we'll come to see, Fuchs wasn't exactly a fan of the gallant style in music as a whole, although he was familiar with every contemporary genre because that's what he needed to do to be a court composer. By far, the most famous thing about Fuchs is his 1725 tome Gradus Ad Parnassum, which literally translates to Steps to Parnassus, which itself was a metaphor for perfection. So you could call this Steps Towards Perfection. Mount Parnassus in mythology was the home of the Muses, so Fuchs was saying something a little philosophical in this title. That is, if you want to be inspired, you're going to have to work hard. This book, which as I mentioned earlier was originally published in Latin, was an interesting retrenchment of counterpoint and points to a split between theorists and composers of the time. Basically you had the more conservative composers like Fuchs, who understood music in terms of the horizontal. They understood music in terms of contrapuntal lines, different melodies that flowed together and had different rules for how they worked and locked in to create a coherent whole. And you had other composers who were thinking more along the lines of how we teach music theory today, that is, in terms of figured bass and in terms of harmonic structure, um, more vertical than horizontal. But these vertical rules of harmony ultimately had their origins in older rules of contrapuntal motion, the stuff that Fuchs thought wasn't being properly taught. Part one of this book is basically just a practical guide to tuning theory, not really worth translating because this is stuff that goes all the way back to Pythagoras and continues on into the present day. You know, numbers and intervals and ratios and things like that. Part two is the stuff that is still used. This is why it says from Gratis Ad Parnassum because it's just the second half of this famous book. And this is actually done by Alfred Mann, who I don't want to brag too much, but he was one of my musicological grand teachers and his work translating Fuchs into English was what helped him escape Nazi Germany before he could get killed. The famous second half of this book is a dialogue between two different people. A teacher representing Palestrina, the composer who represents, for many, the utter peak of the Renaissance polyphonic style. It then goes through, basically, lessons in species counterpoint in multiple parts, such that if one does all the exercises, 
one should achieve something of an understanding of counterpoint, if not a mastery. Many music students today will get frustrated with the kind of stuff that's in this book as being outdated or simply arbitrary. There are a lot of rules in here as to way voices can move against one another that seem like they're just plucked out of thin air. Things that seem like they're just there to confuse and harass music students through the ages. And although there are some examples in this book of rules that Fuchs as Palestrina, as this teacher figure, admits that he doesn't quite know why that they are the rules, most of the time he does give at least some justification for why these rules are the way that they are. Most of it comes down to its origins as having to be a singable style. So something that wasn't that singable was out of the question. The interesting thing about the existence of this book is that Fuchs wrote it when he didn't have to. He was clearly worried about his legacy that goes beyond just the music that he wrote for the court. He was worried about the direction of music. In the later Baroque era, composers who worked in the more polyphonic tradition were dying out in favor of composers who worked in a style of directness and simplicity called the Gallant. This was a movement that J.S. Bach's kids were associated with, whereas Bach himself was part of this old guard. Bach had Fuchs in his personal library. Fuchs was part of this tradition that felt like it was under assault. He understood music in a very Renaissance sense, in terms of different voices moving against one another, and he wanted to make sure that that was a resource that could be used by future generations so that the Gallant style didn't totally take over. Fuchs sounds a little bit like a stereotypical Facebook boomer in some of the quotes that he has about this, talking about the unrestrained insanity of composers who refuse to be bound by rules and principles. There's a ton of overlap between these two competing styles of music theory. And while we don't have the time to track the evolution between modes and keys, we can sort of think of Fuchs as this last gasp of this old modal system. See, the modal system back in the day wasn't just, oh, we have Ionian, Dorian, Phrygian, Lydian, Mixolydian, Aeolian, and Locrian. They didn't have Locrian. They started off only having six notes in these. Uh, there were also hypo versions of these. It's a real complicated mess. And the way they called notes was through this complicated system called the gamut. And this gives us the phrase running the gamut. But what this means is that the way notes were called in this system differed wildly from the way notes were called in the other emergent system. Theorists on the other side of this coin, like Johann Matheson, who's a proponent of letter names, which really only work if you're sticking to one or two modes, that is, the ones that became major and minor. The publication of Gratis Ad Parnassum was a double-edged sword for Fuchs and his legacy. It's the thing that people remember, but they don't remember his music nearly as much. In 1731, his wife passed away, and for the last 10 years of his life, when illness wasn't keeping him from writing music, Fuchs wrote sacred works. And he died in February 1741, at the age of 80, 81, 80, somewhere around, somewhere in his early 80s, maybe he was 80. Again, we just don't know exactly when he was born, otherwise we would be able to say exactly how old he was. Obviously. Maybe. I'm not that great at math. So why is Fuchs's music not better known? There are a number of factors, some more surprising than others. We could just say it's bad luck, and there's definitely some of that. Most Baroque composers aren't played today, and most of their works from the Baroque era don't even survive to the modern day. We could say that, well, there's no composer earlier than Bach that's really known in the cultural zeitgeist, but it's not like Fuchs was that much older than Bach. I mean, he died nine years before Bach did. We could just blame Gratis Ad Parnassum and say, well, he was better known as a theorist than he was as a composer, but Schoenberg and Hindemith were also theorists, and their work as composers overshadows their work as theorists. We could say that his music was just outdated. It was out of style, but Bach's music was also thought of as being out of style. Not saying they're of the same caliber, but I just don't think that's a legitimate reason as to why Fuchs isn't better known. The nail in the coffin for Fuchs's music, at least to me, is how much his music is intimately tied into a time and a place. He was a late bloomer by his own admission, and his creative work as a composer was spurred on by his court appointment. He was a composer because that was just a good career move. Working for the Habsburgs meant writing music with text geared specifically towards the ideology of the Holy Roman Empire. So there's a good chunk of Fuchs's music that 
doesn't have a whole lot of replay value in terms of text. But in terms of musical texture, this is where Fuchs's Lava Palestrina shone through. The Misa di San Carlo could be subtitled 14 Ways of Writing a Canon. But again, Fuchs was just out of step with the times, which had already moved away from counterpoint as the be-all, end-all of composition. But if I were Fuchs, I wouldn't be so upset with that because if I wrote this and I knew how influential it was into the history of Western music, I would not care if my music never got played again. Not only did Bach have it in his library, but Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, everyone after that has been indebted to this as a way of teaching counterpoint, as a way of learning how notes are supposed to go against other notes. And the classical style that those three pioneered, especially Haydn, was based on the easiness and the balance of the Galant style combined with a much more refined internal structure which is due to careful study of the Fuchs text. It's telling that Ludwig Ritter von Kirchel, better known for cataloging Mozart's works, also studied and cataloged Fuchs. Without Fuchs helping to put the brakes on the runaway simplicity of the Galant, the music of the classical era would have sounded a lot different, and how composers have been taught since would have massively changed. This text established a standard for composition as a craft, an attitude that has continued to the present.